the dance on the beefsteak by e f benson the dance on the beefsteak this midsummer day the early hours of which were bathed in so serene a sunshine has ended in storm and hurly-burly only this morning the general outlook was as unclouded as is now the velvet blue of the star-scattered italian sky but this evening our very souls are driven like dead leaves before a shriveling blast nature unsympathetic indifferent still holds on her great unruffled courses the stars wheel the north wind blows lightly from across the gulf the little ripples shed themselves in lines of phosphorescent flame naples lies a necklace of light on the edge of the sea the loveliness of the southern night is undiminished but mrs mckellar has danced on the beefsteak and she has dismissed Seraphina. To the dweller in cities or other light-minded and populous places, this may appear but the most farcical of tragedies, worthy of no more than the scoffing laugh of a passer-by. But such do not know Mrs. McKellar, nor Seraphina, nor life in Alatri. For in Alatri, as a rule, nothing happens, certainly nothing unpleasant. Our lives are as smooth as the halcyon summer seas, and it will, I am afraid, be impossible to give to any but the most imaginative reader an adequate idea of the devastating nature of the catastrophe. It will be necessary, in any case, to recount in brief the events of the last twenty-four hours." Yesterday afternoon we were all on fate. Mrs. McKellar gave a party for two reasons, either of which was amply justifiable. The first was that the engagement of Serafina, her cook, to Antonio, her manservant, was definitely sanctioned by her, and so made food for public rejoicing. The second that Serafina had been with her as cook for an entire year now in a lottery servants do not as a rule stop with mrs mckellar more than a few weeks then they leave there is no dissatisfaction expressed and no public quarrel they just lose their nerve and go away but the days had added themselves into weeks and the weeks into months and before any of us knew where we were seraphina had been a year with mrs mckellar hence the party there were in fact two parties for seraphina and antonio entertained their friends in the kitchen while mrs mckellar received on the house roof she is an immense scotchwoman broad in bosom and in accent and feels the heat acutely Consequently, when I received an invitation for four o'clock on an afternoon in the middle of June, it was clear that she must have a real desire to celebrate the event. The Duchess of Alatri, to her more intimate friends Bianca, came with me by special invitation. Her grace is a huge white Campania sheepdog, so tall that she can, when sitting down, put her chin on an ordinary dining-room table and eat your bread when you are not looking. At rest she resembles a large rug, and as such is not infrequently trodden on, and when in motion she resembles nothing that I have ever seen. Her sole method of progression is a trot. She never walks, and she cannot gallop, but the trot varies from a pace so surprisingly slow that she appears only to be marking time, to that of the passage of an express train." the other day she was investigating interesting smells in the piazza when out for a walk with me and so got left behind i did not miss her till i was some half mile away and looking round saw a distant white speck where the road leaves the town i whistled shrilly on my fingers and without appreciable interval she was with me she belongs not, alas, to me, but to an American, who has left the enchanted island for the summer, unless perhaps it is more just to say that he belongs to her, and committed her grace to my care. Her passions are being combed, cheese, and dancing. 
This latter I discovered by a happy accident, for the first afternoon that she was with me she was very sorrowful, and though I ran up the stars and stripes on the flagstaff instead of the Union Jack, wondering if this would give her the thrill of home, she remained dispirited. But shortly before going to bed, hoping in some vague way to cheer her, and being myself futile, I danced round her, snapping my fingers— the effect was magical. The rug shuffled swiftly to its feet and began gambling. She jumped in the air. She turned briskly round and round. She took little leaps with her head down like a bucking pony. She upset a small table, on which was standing an open tin of biscuits, and scarcely pausing to sweep up the greater part with her tongue, she lurched heavily into an oleander tub on the veranda, snapping the shrub off short and when about ten minutes later i sank into a chair breathless and exhausted the duchess was herself again only once when passing her old home did she show any desire to remain there and even then i had but to execute two fantastic steps down the path when she gave a sort of choking cry her apology for a bark and came after me behaving like a rocking-horse so bianca and i went up the steep path to mrs mckellar's shortly after four yesterday afternoon she lives in a stucco castle with battlements there was already a tarantella going on in the kitchen seraphina is a notable dancer and bianca brightened up she said this is the place for me and brushing rudely by me trotted down the back stairs and i saw her no more so I went alone to the house roof. All Alatri was there, perspiring under an oriental awning, which Mrs. McKellar had put up for the shelter of her guests. It seemed calculated to concentrate the heat of the sun and to exclude all air. The German doctor, who has not left the island even to go to Naples for nine years, was talking the native dialect to a Swedish painter. The mysterious Russian widow, who plays piquet every evening with her man-cook, was chattering voluble French to a circle of mixed nationality, and Mrs. McKellar, resplendent in tartan, was treating bewildered listeners to the people's speech. The ices had transformed themselves into a delicious fruit cream, and the sugar was melting like tallow off the cakes. We indulged in the usual topics, the impossibility of leaving a lottery that summer, the promise of a fine vintage, the apocryphal shark three meters long, whose dorsal fin had appeared only a few yards from the shore of the bagno, the iniquity of servants in general, and the conspicuous virtue of Serafina. Mrs. McKellar, in the democratic spirit that helps to make a lottery so wildly interesting, had added that when the feasting in the kitchen was over, and when no one wanted to eat more ice cream on the housetop, the party from below should join the party up above, so that we all should be one on this happy occasion. Accordingly, after a while, she leaned over the battlements of her castle, gave a loud war cry, and up came Serafina's party. She led the way with her promesso, in a state of high hilarity, and all the servants of all Mrs. McKellar's guests brought up the rear. There was no blushing possible, for everybody was scarlet with heat already, and we split off into domestic groups. Francesco sat by me, and began to tell me why nobody went to Mass on this name-day of St. John the Baptist. This was interesting, but on the other side of me was Serafina, discussing Trousseau with her mistress, and the loud arresting Italian of Mrs. McKellar only permitted me to give half an ear to the story of San Giovanni. However, Francesco could tell me about it again tomorrow, in less distracted conditions, and when the discussion about the trousseau was over, I had gathered several plums, un tartano di Edinburgh being a fine one, I left. Next morning I had a crisis of affairs. In a lottery, if one has anything whatever that must be done, it, like the grasshopper, 
becomes a burden, but I had several things that must be done, and I was nearly crushed by the prospect. In the first place, breakfast was ready before I was out of bed, and I therefore had to postpone shaving till afterwards. This alone would have made a troublesome morning, but this was far from all. On coming down, I found two letters that had to be answered— one, and I was sorry for my sins, containing an uncorrected proof, and while I was still prostrate from the blow, Francesco came in with household accounts. These, for the sake of morality, I make it a rule to check. Francesco's addition is always right, mine always wrong, and thus it stood to reason that I should not be able to start down to the sea to bathe till nearly eleven. However, no Britons to be balked, and I marched manfully across the thirsty desert of affairs. An hour in the sea and the consciousness of duty done restored equanimity, and when after lunch Francesca brought me coffee on to the veranda and seemed disposed to linger, I remembered the half-heard story of San Giovanni. Tell it me again, I said, and Francesco told it. The signor must know he said, that in Italy there are many unbaptized children, and if San Giovanni came to earth like the other saints on his name-day, he would be furious at such neglect, and burn up the earth with fire. God knows this, and being unwilling that we should all suffer, he sends San Giovanni to sleep the day before his name-day, so that he sleeps for eight days." Then, when he wakes up, he says to God, Is not my name day yet? And God replies, O oh, San Giovanni, you have been to sleep, and your name day is over while you slept. It will not come again for another year. Thus it is that we do not go to Mass on the day of San Giovanni, for where is the use if he is asleep? But the priests say, Ah, has not the Signor heard the news? He broke off suddenly and excitedly. News? I've heard no news. How can I have forgotten? The Signora McKellar has danced on her beefsteak, and Serafina is dismissed. So when will she marry Antonio? Now the two things a southern Italian loves best are telling a story and causing a sensation, and it was with the most exquisite enjoyment that Francesco continued, for both were here combined. The market boat came in from Naples this morning, he said, and on it was a fine beefsteak for the signora. Salvador, the carrier, took it up, and it so was that both the signora and Serafina were on the house roof when he came, and the signora was ordering dinner, and it seems she was angry, so said Salvatore, at the cost of the ice cream yesterday. So he was ordered to bring up the beefsteak, and the signora smelt it, and said it was not food for dogs, and Salvatore, you know he is a sharp fellow, he replied, indeed it is not food for dogs, meaning thereby, yes, I understand, I interrupted. Francesco was getting gesticulative, and he went on with the fire of a prophet, then gave the signora the beefsteak to Serafina, he cried, and said, Smell it thou also. And Serafina, having smelt it, said, Signora, it seems to me very good. At that the Signora turned on her like one goaded and cried, Thou too art in the plot to cheat me. Today thou art no more my cook. And as for the beefsteak, echo! And she threw it down and danced upon it with both feet together, so that the roof trembled. Also, she said many strange words in her own tongue. And Francesco, like a true artist, did not linger after making his point, but turned on his heel, resisting even the temptation to talk it all over, and went into the house. Here was a bolt from the blue. The summer had begun. There would be no fresh visitors to a lottery till the winter, and Serafina would be out of place all these months. Antonio's wages would not keep them both, if Serafina was out of place, and had to pay for her board and lodging with some friend, and who knew whether Mrs. McKellar's wrath would not spread like a devouring flood, and overwhelm Antonio also?' 
nothing was more likely for i remembered how on the dismissal of mrs mckellar's last cook her washing had been withdrawn from its customary manipulator simply because she was the cook's cousin by marriage how then should seraphina's promesso escape already the smell of the marriage bake meats was in the air they were like to eat them with a sauce of sorrow to attempt to interfere or to reason with Mrs. McKellar was out of the question. Her nose would go in the air, and she would say, Hoots! Those who had heard Mrs. McKellar say Hoots seriously knew what fear was. Two days have passed after that terrible dance of death on the house roof, two days of paralyzed inaction. There was, of course, no other subject in the mouth of the folk, and grave groups formed and reformed in the piazza and at Morgano's, and looked at the question this way and that, like impotent conspirators wanting a plan of action. I happened to be sitting at that café before dinner on the second evening, and we were shaking our heads over it all, when Mrs. McKellar herself came snorting and stamping round the corner like children detected in some forbidden ecstasy we all sank into silence she did not even sit down to enjoy her vermouth but sipped it standing with loud angry sucking noises as if it was the life-blood of seraphina we all froze under the contempt of her blue tremendous eye and then most unfairly she singled me out and pointing the finger of scorn hissed at me oh, i can find what the hail clam janfrey of ye has been talking about she said or words to that effect, and without deigning to translate, this tempestuous lady swept on her course. She stepped so high in her indignation that the Duchess of Alatri, lying for coolness' sake on the pavement outside, thought that Mrs. McKellar was dancing for her, and rising to her feet, her grace trod a circular Saracenic measure hardly pausing to swing a string-bag containing such comestibles as would be easily rendered palatable without the aid of a cook mrs mckellar turned to me again and spoke in english in order that i might understand if i were you she said i should be ashamed to keep a dog that eats as much as six christians all be bound be they presbyterians or roman catholics even as she spoke, who should come by but Seraphina herself, though she had been hounded out of the Casa McKellar only yesterday, with every circumstance of ignominy and highland expressions, Seraphina, sunny and incapable of rudeness, gave her late employer a little smile and a little obeisance, and said, Bueno sera, signora without the smallest doubt mrs mckellar returned that smile now in a lottery i must have you know we are all great psychologists and students of character and often talk about each other's actions and the gloomy traits of character exhibited therein so that if you didn't know the seriousness of our aims you might think we were gossips but the true character of mrs mckellar who she is inside herself had always puzzled everybody no one could pull her together into any sort of personage who would pass muster in the wildest work of fiction as being conceivable why for instance did she who averted her chaste eye from the naked foot of a fisher-boy herself wear a tight silk bathing-dress that reached not quite to her knees and nowhere near her elbows was it as mrs leonard said to display the atrocity of her own figure and thereby strengthen the rickety morality of the world in general that could hardly be the case since on other occasions she laced herself so tight and wore such a killing hat and so many cairngorms and garnets that she could not be found guiltless of making a public temptation of herself why again by what possible psychological consistency did she revel in a game of poker and reserve the hostility of her finest colloquialisms for those who took tickets at a lottery why again but there is no use in multiplying her contradictions for she entirely consists of them 
but the salient point on which every psychologist's eye was pensive today was why she had dismissed Serafina after a year's harmonious cooperation for agreeing with Salvatore that a particular beefsteak did not stink. Never had she had such a servant as Serafina, nor ever would, and well she knew it. Someone suggested that Mrs. McKellar had determined to be an eater of uncooked foods, and others who remembered her welter of appreciation over an ordinary mutton cutlet hardly troubled to reply to so inadmissible a conjecture. As we whittled away at her, the point of the discussion grew ever sharper, for why had she so clearly smiled in answer to Serafina's greeting just now? The idea that the smile was purely sardonic had most supporters, one or two who kindly upheld the view that she was meaning to make it up with Serafina were hissed down. The most obdurate alone stuck to it, and had the hardihood to bet five liras that this was the true explanation of the smile, and the readiness with which he found takers for that bet caused him to experience an access of prudence, and to explain that he only meant to bet five liras all told, and not fifty. Alas! No one was walking in my direction, and some half an hour later I went slowly home. Already I was beginning to regret that I had not taken more of those bets, for the shrewdest analyst of motive and psychology in a lottery had been bound to confess that Mrs. McKellar's motives, like the path of the comets that should, according to all calculations, periodically destroy the earth, were, when all was said and done, completely unconjecturable. No application of logic or reason of the movements of heavy bodies seemed to apply to them, and for that very reason I had rejected the sardonic nature of that smile for Serafina, and in the spirit of credo quia impossible, had taken it for a smile of reconciliation. But I stood to win five liras, and who would quarrel with so enviable a conclusion, especially since it implied the reinstallation of Serafina? That was not a wholly altruistic consideration, for Leonard had said in so many words that Mrs. McKellar would probably attempt to seduce Francesco away from my service with the lure of higher wages. That was a horrible thought, and I quickened my steps as I came near to my villa. I heard bounding footsteps coming down the outside stairs, from the front door into the garden, which could only be Francesco's, and I wondered whether he was prancing towards me, in order to communicate his wonderful good luck in going as cook to Mrs. McKellar, at twice the wages he at present received. I believed Mrs. McKellar, like the prophet Habakkuk, to be capable de tout, but I didn't really believe this infamy of Francesco. The garden door flew open, and he met me with a face of mourning. The Signora McKellar, he cried, walked up with Serafina to her house. Through your telescope, Signor, I saw them kissing and kissing on the roof. Dio, why does a woman want to kiss a woman? There are many strange things in this world, Signor. St. Peter, he had a wife, and also his wife had a mother, and one day... "'Tell me about it after dinner,' I said, "'and bring up the bottle of English wine, "'the port wine, which I brought from Rome. "'I have won five liras, Francesco.' Signor," said Francesco, "'but the dinner is not yet quite ready, "'for I was watching with your telescope. Five liras! "'There was once a man who backed five numbers at the lotto, "'and behold, they all came out, even as he had backed them. "'He won a hundred thousand liras, and an estate in Calabria, and—' "'Dinner,' said I, and Francesco ran to the kitchen. "'I walked on air. "'Alone that evening I had had the courage of my opinion, "'and for once had divined Mrs. McKellar's mind "'to the extent of backing my divination for five liras. "'That is a lot of money here, "'for a stall at the cinema, front row, only costs one. End of section four.